on to Genesis chapter 7 tonight. We had been in Genesis chapter 6 for several weeks, and now uh, I'm, I... Let's go to chapter 7, amen? Uh, and let's begin with verse number 1. And Lord willing, that's probably all that we'll cover tonight is what we see in verse number 1. We'll read several verses for contextual purposes, and uh, uh, but we'll concentrate on a few things that we see in verse number 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and a beast that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. Thank you, Lord, again for your wonderful word. Please uh, help us hear you and see you now. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we've stated many times in these studies, we are desiring to understand God more by studying the first book of the Bible. Uh, we are looking at different things that took place, but we're trying to look at them from the lens of what is this teaching us about God? Not necessarily what is this teaching us about Noah, not what is this teaching us about the ark itself. Not that those are, aren't good studies, because they are. But when we look here, uh, before we jump right into verse 1, I wanted to remember what we just went over in chapter 6. So we're not going to go over all of chapter 6, but here was the, what we discussed in our last lesson, our last couple of lessons. One of the things that we learned in chapter 6 is that God can be grieved to the point of judgment. He can be so grieved by humankind that He can cast or, or, or judge we learned that God extended grace again, uh, just as He did with Adam and Eve. When, when there were only one man and one woman, the one man and the one woman failed God. What did God do? He came to them. They did not go running to God. They went running from God. So we see God extending grace in the beginning. Now we're also seeing Him years later extending grace because he gave Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, so we see that uh, he has done with Noah after the failure of the human race. So what he did with Adam and Eve after their failure, he has now done in the life of Noah after the failure of the human race. Uh, the Bible says that man's hearts we're on evil continually. And the Bible says, And the world was filled with violence. Men are not good to each other. Uh, we can try, uh, but at our best, we can't, we, we can't be good apart from the Lord. That's just, that's just the reality. It's His divine influence, which is, would be a good definition of grace, is the divine influence upon a heart, upon a person, uh, with that person having no merit, but just God influencing them. So Noah found grace. The truth is, this is what we learned. The only hope for humanity is the grace of God. We learned our last time together what it means to experience the grace of God. God's grace changes a person. God's grace can bring household salvation. God's grace causes a person to hear God. God's grace brings a person into the purposes of God, and God's grace ensures instruction, equipping, and enablement for all that God has for a person's life. And so that's the wonderful thing about God and His grace. 
So now in verse number one, and the Lord said unto Noah, come thou and all thy household into the ark for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. So uh, Lord help us to understand this verse. It is important to note that God was watching how Noah was affected by finding grace. In chapter 6, as we've read in the past, in chapter 6 we see that God saw the wickedness of man. God saw the wickedness of man. But here's what God also sees. God also sees the effects of His grace. God sees, look at what it says, Noah come thou and thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous. Okay, you still with me? So, but let, we need to pay attention to how this is worded. I am not, and I think it's obvious, I am not a Hebrew scholar. Uh, I don't, I had a man who ordained me read Hebrew and Greek and could probably have, and, and spoke Hebrew and Greek and probably could have teached Taught, teach. See, I can't even speak English. It even taught in Hebrew and Greek. I'm not. I'm not a Hebrew or Greek scholar, okay? So, but when, when I'm looking, here's what I'm seeing, that the Bible, sometimes what the Bible doesn't say is as important as what the Bible does say, okay? Now look at what it says. For thee have I seen righteous. I have seen righteous. It's not that I have seen your righteousness. See, that's different. I have seen, for thee have I seen righteous. Now, this is really important, and I hope that you'll grab a hold of this, because this, this, maybe this will help you. How does God now see Noah? It's not talking about, I have seen your righteousness or I've not seen your righteousnesses. He's now saying, I see, I have seen you righteous. There is the reality of how when we are, when we come into the grace of God, how now God sees us. How did He see us before? And how does He see us now? He sees us righteous. Now, here's what you and I need to comprehend, and hopefully this will help you. He is not seeing your righteousness. Okay? If we are dependent upon our righteousness, here's what the Scripture says about all. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So even when I, and this is, and forgive me, I'm getting ready to use a personal example again. But I, when, when I was younger, I, I have a personality trait that compels me to feel guilt most of the time. I've, I'm, if, you, if you're asking who's the most guilty person in the room, me. That's me. I'm the guilty one here. And so I, I even to the point where the idea of, that I did something wrong, I would tail on myself all the time. I would go to my mother and say, I've done this, I did this, I've done this, I've done this. I was the guy that when people were getting ready to do something wrong, I'd say, no, we're not going to do that. That's going too far. We're just not going to do that. And, but that didn't make me a Christian, you see. That's personality trait. I just have this personality trait. Well, but what did it compel me to do? It compelled me to establish righteousness. Now, how was I going to establish, because I grew up in a Christian house. Now, I don't know how I would have been had I grown up in a Christian home. I probably still would have been who God made me in that sense. But I don't know how I'd been, but I happened to grow up in a, a I, I grew up, as my sister would say, you didn't just grow up in a Christian house, you grew up in Johnny Grinstead's house. Okay, So Johnny Grinstead was a man, black and white, bottom line, there is no gray, you know, that's just the way it was. And so there was this sense of that, that, that righteousness existed and I wanted it. And so how was I going to obtain it? And I obtained it in my mind and in my heart on my own. I did it based upon my behaviors and the things that I was doing that was right and the things that I refused to do that were wrong. 
okay? It was based upon me doing right or me doing wrong. So when I would do wrong, I would confess. When I would do right, I was righteous. Now, that sounds almost like Christianity, but it's not, okay? That's religion. That's self-righteousness. As you've heard me say before, it compelled me, this desire compelled me to read my Bible a lot. So when I was a kid, I read the Bible a lot. I read, I read five, a minimum of five chapters a day. I started in the sixth or seventh grade and I would read five chapters of the Bible every day and fasted and prayed every Saturday. I didn't eat on Saturdays. That was my day. I fasted and I prayed. I lived in the mountains. You know what I did? I'd climb to the top of those mountains. And if you had been up there with me, you would have heard me begging for forgiveness from God. I would cry out to God because I wanted to be right with God. But all of that was based up on my own righteousnesses. And when, when you're in that realm and, when you're, and almost when you're, in a, when you're in a world where performance is praised as righteousness, it's real easy to get caught up in a performance-based relationship with an almighty God who knows everything. Now, the wonderful thing about God is He still loved me, even though I was trying to establish my own righteousness. If you had asked me, have you asked Jesus to save you, I would have said yes, because I can't tell you how many times I asked Jesus to save me over the course of my life, okay? I, I can't tell you how many times, all right? But there, there became a time when there is the reality of you're no longer trusting yourself for righteousness, but you are trusting Jesus for His righteousness. And it's because of the, the grace of God, okay? The grace of God will do something that, that nothing else will do. The grace of God will accomplish what the wrath of man will not. Now, I was afraid of the wrath of God, which, the, you know, to fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, okay? I understand that. But I also feared my dad. But I also feared what people were going to think of me, okay? I was scared to death of what people might find out about me, okay? So I became very performance-based. Are you still with me? I became very performance-based, and it kept compounding, it kept compounding, it kept compounding. And, and, you know, what happened, Chris? How, what was the deliverance? Complete and utter moral failure. That was the deliverance. Moral failure. I sinned. I'd been sinning the whole time, okay? I was a sinner, but moral failure. What? Yes, moral failure led me to to understand I need... See, you've got you to be a sinner to get saved. It plain, the, the Jesus plain says is that He's come to, he come to call the unrighteous. The righteous don't need... The, the whale don't need a physician, right? So people that are self-righteous, they, they never need the righteousness. You say, well, what's it got to do with this verse? Well, when you look at this, how does God see us? He says, I seen, for thee have I seen righteous. In other words, Noah, I see you righteous. Why? Because he's experienced the grace of God. What is the separation between Noah and these other human beings? Okay, if it was, if it was good works... Does it mean that there was absolutely nobody on the planet at that time doing good but Noah? I think, that it's, I think it's fairly clear that Noah began to do good because he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So uh, it, it does not say that God sees the righteousness of Noah. This is one of the things that we must understand about God. Was Noah inherently righteous? No. Noah was not inherently righteous. 
And know what, look at what it says in Genesis chapter 9, verse 20. Flip over just a couple of pages there, a few pages. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 20. And this is after, now li listen, this is after Noah finds grace. This is after Noah builds the ark. This is after Noah is saved uh, from the punishment of, of God. Noah, now look at what it says. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine. And it was intoxicating. Why? Because he drank of the wine and was drunken and was uncovered within his tent. So here's what happened in Noah's life. Noah got drunk and Noah disrobed. Okay? Now, I'm not throwing stones. Trust me, I don't have any thrones to throw, uh, stones to throw at anybody. And, and he was in his tent, in all fairness. But is this, does this look like a man who is, is, who is practicing self-control? It does not. It does not look like a man who's practicing self-control. And so here's what's happened. Uh, he, he, he got naked, and so uh, it was in his tent, but it still was not his, let's just say this, it was not Noah's best moment. So we know that Noah was not inherently righteous, okay? He could do wrong. He could do the wrong thing. Well, see, when someone is inherently righteous, you can't do the wrong thing. It's impossible to do wrong. God, it's impossible for God to do wrong. Impossible. He cannot do wrong. But Noah could. So when Noah is being seen by God and, and God is saying, I seen righteous, for thee have I seen righteous. He's obviously not talking about some inherent thing. When God looked upon Noah, he saw the righteous effects of grace being bestowed upon Noah. God saw that Noah was behaving righteous. And so when you look in this, this, to this word righteous, it, it genuinely means uh, basically behaving to the law, adhering, obeying is basically what it means. And so he says, I see you obeying. And Noah... Uh, reacted with faith, and see, it, it, it is his faith that produced the works of obedience. Why did Noah build the ark? Now, uh, if we've got our numbers right, Noah is told to build the ark, and about 120 years later, the, the ark's built. Okay? So this was a long building project. Okay? So here we, here we go. Now, what, 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 was, what was seen? God saw Noah obeying, building the ark. What was that? Well, obedience. God says righteous. You're obeying. You're, you're obeying the law. Why did he do that? Why in the world did Noah do that? Well, it's not because he was inherently righteous. He did it by faith. He heard God, and he followed God. He did what God told him to do. So when we consider this, let's look at a New Testament verse. In James chapter 2, verse 23. James chapter 2, verse 23 says this, And the Scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Okay? So we have this word, it is a doctrinal word in the New Testament. It's the word imputed. This is the doctrine of imputation. And the doctrine of imputation. What does that word imputed mean? Some of you already know, uh, and maybe all of you already know. But the word imputed means to put on someone's account. It's an accounting term, okay? It's like, as you've heard it explained probably, on Abraham's account. Now, this, we're, we've shifted to Abraham, okay? But until this moment in Abraham's life, you know what Abraham was? Abraham was like his family. He was an idolater. Abraham was not believing in the one true God. 
Genesis chapter 12 tells us we are introduced to this man by the name of Abraham, and Abraham was surrounded by idolaters. So being surrounded by idolaters, odds are, if Abraham was going to worship a god, it was not the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay? It was going to be a false god. But what happens, the one true God, by grace, called Abraham and said, Leave your family, leave this country, and I will show you a country that I'm going to give you and your seed, your, your lineage. And at that time, Abraham didn't have any children. Okay, So if we want to take the, the story a little bit further, so let's do that. Let's go to Romans chapter number 4. This is a New Testament passage as well, and it's referencing Abraham. So Romans chapter 4, and I really am, I guess, maybe at, at risk of rushing through something. Um, in, in Romans chapter 4, Let's just go through this and let's take our time, okay? Now, Romans is, is written by a Hebrew, the Apostle Paul, and he is re reading or writing, excuse me, and trying to teach on, in this particular moment especially, on justification. Now, justification is another doctrinal word. Justification is the doctrine, it is the New Testament doctrine that teaches this, that people can be right and people can be right with God. Okay? We can be right with God. That's the simplest way for me to say what justification means. Now if you break it down, justice, just, justice. So this is a legal term. So now we've got a an accounting term operating with a legal term. If you are standing in front of a judge and you are let go, you are found not guilty. Okay? Justice was served and you were found not guilty. Well, justice can also be served when a person is found guilty. Does this make sense? And so now here we're dealing with someone, Paul is teaching about justification. So what shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he have whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted, an accounting term, unto him for righteousness. So it seems as though righteousness and justified are working together here. Now, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned, another accounting term, of grace, but of debt, another accounting term. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth, believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now, in these first five verses, the Apostle Paul is letting us know. Remember, James told us, told us that something was imputed to Abraham. The Apostle Paul is reiterating also what James is saying. So this is a teaching that has been in the church since its inception. And they both go back and reference what would be known as the patriarch of faith. If you were a kid, maybe you grew up in Sunday school, Father Abraham had many sons. Why do we call him Father Abraham? Because he is the father of faith. He heard God. God called him out of idolatry to go to a place and God, there wasn't an image to be built. There was nothing. It was just a relationship between a man and God. God. Abraham did what God told him to do. Now as you move on, 
But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So Paul is teaching and James is teaching that it's a question of faith. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness. Oh, there's that word, imputeth righteousness without works. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. So here's, what's, here's what Paul is, is having to battle against. And it's this act of circumcision, okay? The early church was going through a difficult time because the Apostle Paul was preaching and teaching to Gentiles that you get saved by faith in Christ alone. Faith in Christ alone, not by works. There was a group that believed you got saved by faith in Christ but to, this is the wrong terminology, but to really be saved, you had to also be circumcised, even if, you, even if you were a Gentile, okay? Now, why would they say that? It's because of what that meant to the Christian Jews and what it meant to Jews, period. It was the sign that you were, it was the sign that you had been obedient to God, okay? As we go on, how was it then reckoned? How did it all, what was the conclusion? What was the accounting? How did it, when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So here's what the Apostle Paul's basically teaching. Abraham believed God in Genesis chapter 12 and was not told to circumcise his seed until later on. He's making, this, he's making this factual, historical, everybody knew. This, the, the Abraham believed God, and that's why he was accounted, seen, if you please, righteous, because of faith. Excuse me. And he received the sign of circumcision a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So he's, he's defending and taking up for the Gentiles and teaching to the Gentiles and to the Jews as well, but he's teaching you Gentiles can be saved without circumcision. And he's saying to the Jews, these Gentiles have been saved without this act, okay? As we move on, are you still with me? Uh, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had been being yet uncircumcised. So now here's what you have to understand, that before Abraham... Uh, received this covenant sign from the Father. He was in paganism, and we need to understand something. There was no circumcision until Abraham. Does this make sense? This is, this is, this is how dramatic of an issue this was because to the Jewish people, this separated them from all other humanity. They were different. They were God's people, right? And we're not denying that they were God's chosen people, but friends, this is the wonderful thing. Jesus changed everything. This is a new covenant, okay? It's a new covenant being introduced to some old ways of thinking. Okay, now for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. 
See, God told him to go, and the promise was made to him before there was an introduction to circumcision. You get this, right? For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. So if it is by the law, by obedience to the law, that that's what makes a person righteous, then guess what? Faith is made void and the promise of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is so. It is of faith. There's no so there. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. He's basically saying what was connecting the Gentiles with the Jews so that we can all be partakers of the promises of God is faith. Faith. He's saying these Gentiles do not have the circumcision of Abraham, but that's not what made Abraham righteous. Abraham believed God. And he's saying, these Gentiles have done the same thing. Abraham was looking forward to the coming seed that was going to save the world. The Gentiles are looking back and saying, oh, Jesus was and is this Savior that is saving the world. Is this making sense? Now, how did we all come into this relationship? How, how, how have we been made right with God, justified. Faith in Jesus. Not just having faith, but faith. Abraham had faith. He, he left idolatry. He left other gods because the one true God promised him that through his seed, which is Jesus the world would be saved. Abraham was looking for... He, Abraham was not the Savior. Abraham was promised the Savior would come. Are we getting this? And so that motivated him. That, that He put faith in that. And what are we putting our faith in? We're putting faith in the seed, which is Jesus. It's just make, I know it's making sense. As it is written... I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And it's true. He is the father of many nations. Being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. The Apostle Paul is simply arguing his justification had nothing to do with circumcision. It had everything to do with believing what God said he was going to do. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, talking about God had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our what? justification. Our justification rests in what Jesus did. I can be right with God, not because what I do, but because what Jesus did. Where's, where's your faith? Where's your faith? Who is your faith in? Your faith it has to transfer. It has, there is this reality. The repentance part is you leave the gods of this world. You quit trusting the gods of this world. And you trust Jesus. You leave your self-righteousness 
and you admit it's filthy rags and you ask Jesus to make you righteous. You trust in Jesus. Everybody okay? Now, and here's the thing. God then sees us righteous. God saw Noah righteous. Why? Because he believed God's Word. He believed God's Word. After, listen, experiencing the grace of God. So then this question arises. How in, oh, how in the world can a person get enough faith? And, and if you've got issues, you'll struggle with that. Friend, it's by the grace of God. It's the grace of God. You can't, it's not that you muster up the faith. It's the grace of God. You're given the faith. You, you're trying to tell me, preacher, that it's this simple, that if I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and that God resurrected Him from the dead for my justification, it's that simple. It's that simple. And that makes it difficult for some people. It's, I have struggled and struggled and struggled with misplaced faith. And it's caused me trouble. But when I, when I get my head, when I get everything get squared away, and I, oh, wait a minute, I, am I, who am I trusting? Oh, well, I can't trust me. I'm trusting you, Jesus. And then, if you would, uh, let's go down uh, to John, or not down, but jump over to John chapter 6. I've, I've taken up most of my time. I'm going to skip a point and move down. So this next point is simply this. God saves all who come by faith. Look at what he says back there in, in Genesis. Genesis chapter 7. He says, um, I'll read it to you so you can stay there in John. Genesis chapter 7. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. And if you go on down to Genesis chapter 7, I think it's verse number 13. In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. You know what they did? They just walked into the ark. That's all they did. You, truth be known, you can't really find where they actually built the ark. It says Noah built the ark. I'm not going to get in an argument over that. Good chances they helped him, okay? Uh, but I'm just saying... Where do you see the faith of Noah's family? They walked into the ark. That's it. They didn't do any... No, they walked into the ark. When God said, it's time to get in the ark, okay, it's getting in the ark. That's faith. When we look at this, John 6, 35, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in... Look at this. He that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. By faith they walked into the ark. Jesus makes this statement. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son, that seeth the S-O-N, not the S-U-N, the Son. He says, all that which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. Now, 
Go with me now to Numbers chapter 21. It may have been easier to flip back to John chapter 3, so flip back to John chapter 3. And we'll read verse 14, John chapter 3, then we'll go to Numbers 21. So John chapter 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Are you with me? So Jesus Christ is referencing something that took place in the days of Moses. He lifted a serpent up in the wilderness. You're familiar with the story, but let's read it anyway. Go with us now to Numbers chapter 21, verse number 4. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Now this is the attitude of the people. And the people spake against God and against Moses, Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? They are accusing God of killing them in the wilderness. For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread, so... Just to make a point, there was bread. It just wasn't the bread that they were eating in Egypt. It was this bread that was coming from heaven, manna, that Jesus Christ references himself as in John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. You see the the reference. And so here's here's what the problem was with the Israelites. The bread that was being given to them from heaven was not enough. Okay, so what Jesus, we could, we could make this reference, and I think fairly right. I think, it's, I think it's accurate. To say that they rejected the bread from heaven, it's the same thing to reject that Jesus is enough. To reject that what Jesus did is enough. Oh my, oh me. What Jesus did is enough. He is the bread from heaven. But he goes on to say, Verse 20, uh, chapter 21, verse 6 of Numbers, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. So these poisonous, fiery serpents. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us, and Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it up on a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, the serpent on the pole, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it up on a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now here's some things I want us to understand, or I think the Lord wants us to understand. One, they said, pray to God that he would remove the serpents, and God did not remove the serpents. That is not what happens in the story. God did not remove the serpents. God provided salvation from the serpent's bite. Okay. Oh God, would you just please remove sin from, from the world? It hasn't happened. Sinners still sin, right? The, the bite is still very real. But how were the children of Moses, or excuse me, the children of Israel saved? They simply, this is it, that was all they had to do. They just had to put their eyes on the serpent on the cross. The very thing that was killing them was hung on a pole. You get it? What did Jesus Christ do on the cross? Jesus Christ became sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God through Him. Is this making, are we getting this? 
So when Jesus Christ, so okay, and Jesus Christ says this. This is is Jesus talking to Nicodemus. He's making reference to this episode in Numbers chapter 21, and he is saying this is as it is. You get it? Look at what it says. I'll go back to John 3, 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus referencing Himself as the Son of Man is saying, I am going to have to be lifted up just like that serpent was. And Nicodemus knew what that meant. Okay? And then he goes on to say that whosoever, hallelujah for the word whosoever being repeated over and over and over again, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have what? Eternal life. They looked upon what was killing them. They looked upon the serpent on the pole, brass speaking of the judgment, and they were looking at the serpent was being judged on that pole. And they, all they had to do was look at it, and they were saved. You know what you, know what you need to do? Look at Jesus on the cross and understand and accept that's it. That is it. You say, that is it and plus. No, that is it. Jesus Christ became sin. He became sin. Like the, like the serpent was on the pole. Sin. What sin? The sins of the world. The sins of the world. And that anybody who will believe that Jesus took on the sins of the world, which means your sin, if you believe that, You'll have eternal life. That's it. Faith, what? In what Jesus did. And I know we've been hearing this, but I also know Satan comes in the middle of the night and disrupts it. Here's what Satan does. He reminds you of your sin. And what we have to do is remind him, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Satan will try to get you to think, well, you've got to go back in your life and confess everything you've ever done wrong. You can't remember it, and it'll turn into a rabbit hole. What you need to do, put your faith in Jesus. Put your faith in Jesus. Jesus says this. Look at verse number 1 still, uh, Genesis chapter 7. Let's go back to it. This will be our closing Lord willing, closing point for the night. Can we handle one more point? Yes. So it's the sub points that wears out. Genesis 7. Look at what he says. Verse number 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house unto the ark. What does this mean? It means God was already in the ark. God didn't say go into the ark. God says, Noah, come. God was in the ark and saying, come in. Here I am, come. Come to me. I'm in. We are called to come to God. We are not being pushed. We are not being treated. The Lord is our shepherd, not our butcher. You heard the expression, you heard the story that a man was watching a flock of sheep coming over a hill, running, and there was a man behind them, whacking them and and yelling and doing all of this. And then there was another man just walking and would every now and then turn around and say a name, and the sheep were just following him. And the man observing says, what's the difference? And he says, well, the man that's behind the sheep driving them, he's driving them as a butcher. He's, He's a butcher. He's not a shepherd. This is the shepherd. And the Lord is our shepherd, and He says, come. God says, come into the ark. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The book, the last book of the Bible ends with Revelation twenty two sixteen. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root of and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. Verse number 17 continues and says, And the Spirit and the bride, meaning the church, say come. And let him that heareth say come. And let him that is athirst come. 
and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. The Lord is saying, come, come. And we would want to say, we would want to say, yeah, but I'm, but I'm dirty. Well, the Lord would say, well, that's what I do. I, I clean up people. We would say, but I'm a sinner. And he would say, I know, but this is what I do. I save people. Noah is called into the ark, not because he has some inherent righteousness, but because he's experienced the grace of God and he's obeyed the voice of God. What is the first thing that you and I need to obey? It's the call to come. Amen. The call to come. Lord, thank you for your mercy and showing us who you are. Um, we, we cannot do, we, we, we can't build our own salvation. It doesn't even, it, we, it doesn't even cross our minds. Uh, what we have is you have preached to us the message of salvation. The ones that were alongside Jesus, we have received their word and we accept this fact. We, we accept that in John chapter 17 that Jesus prayed for those of us that would come to Christ because of their word. Thank you for giving us the written Bible and thank you for giving us your word Thank you for your son Jesus who died for our sins and who resurrected from the dead for our justification. Thank you that we can ask and receive salvation through him. We thank you for that, Father. In the wonderful name of Jesus, please seal this to our hearts for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.